There are two types of people in our gospel lesson today, at least our gospel lesson extended. The content and the hungry. We can also categorize them as saints and sinners. The saints are those who understand themselves to be righteous and so they are content. The sinners are those who understand themselves to be lacking and so they are hungry. Jesus condemns one group and praises the other. But as it typically is with Jesus, it is not as easy as it seems. Right before this passage in the Gospel lesson today, Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders. They ask him, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Jesus responds, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles his father or mother must surely die. Then Jesus, frustrated, doubles down on these scribes and Pharisees. You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy against you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but with their hearts are far, they are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And Jesus turns to the crowd and gathers them around. Hear and understand, he says. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what, come, go, what comes out of the mouth that this defiles a person. Jesus is getting on these religious leaders because they are chastising his disciples for an offense that ranks on the level of grievances as not saying grace before meals. It's about that level. And while it is important to recognize God's provision and thank Him before meals, if one forgets, it's not necessarily a hell-worthy offense. It's a venial sin, or one that clouds the pathway and makes, the thing, and makes things more difficult to see. But it's not a mortal sin which results in spiritual death. Yet here are these religious leaders getting so ticky-tacky in their observance of minor laws that they have made a minor offense into a major and become blind to the fact that they are addressing God himself and accusing him of not observing his own laws. Then Jesus leaves in frustration, needing a break from these people. So he goes to a place that he knows that they will not go to the Gentile land of Tyre and Sidon. A religious leader so content with, with his status is not going to go into this Gentile land. And the woman he encounters there is a physical demonstration of what he has just been telling these religious leaders. This woman left her city and came out to Jesus and cried to him, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. She is not even deterred when he doesn't get the answer she thinks that she should get from Jesus. She only cries out the more. And she, she even cries out to the point where Jesus' disciples are begging him to do something, to send her away. In some ancient commentaries, this woman takes on the characteristics of her city. She is seen as a city as a sinner because she lives in a sinful city. Sinful in that it is con they are considered sinners by the by the people of Israel. These are Gentiles, and one knows that if you are not a part of the the people of Israel, then you must be a sinner. Yet at this point, her first act is to leave the city. This is the first thing we learn from her. If we are known by our actions, this woman should be known for this act, leaving behind what defines her, belong, which is belonging to the sinful Gentile region. So she leaves being a sinner. Then she comes and kneels before Jesus. Lord, help me, she says. She is unaffected when Jesus shoes her away, essentially calling her a Gentile dog. Yes, Lord, she says, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. In essence, is this not the same as confession? She acknowledges her status as a sinner, 
and Jesus as her Lord and Master, and then she asks for an unmerited grace upon her. For Jesus, when he encounters this woman, this buoys him up from his confrontation with the, hip, with the hypocrite religious leaders. Of course he is going to grant her request. In Luke's Gospel, he talks about there being joy in heaven when one sinner repents. This woman is bringing Jesus joy because she is willing to accept him as her Lord, as opposed to the religious leaders who are convinced that they have no sin, so they need no repentance. They need no Lord. They are in in their mentality, and she is out. They want nothing more than to condemn even God himself for these minor offenses. She begins the story as an enemy, but rather than condemning Jesus as her enemy, she proclaims him as her Lord. Of the two groups I mentioned at the beginning, the religious leaders are in the category of the contented saints. The Canaanite woman is the hungry sinner. Yet as Jesus shows us today, the contented saints are condemned while the hungry sinner is the one who is extolled. In the church today, one, might, one of the most harmful things we can do for ourselves and to, is to fall into this category of contented saints. Because when we do this, we stop striving for righteousness because we've achieved it in our own minds. Yet these are the very people Jesus condemns in this chapter of the gospel today. When we stop striving for righteousness, when we believe that our hunger is satisfied, we sit back and relish in our status as those who are fed. And in doing so, Spiritually, we take on the mantle of the religious leaders. Those who are well fed in this way tend to forget that they will be hungry again one day. Being spiritually, dull, being spiritually full dulls our senses to the reality around us. Just like after we stuff ourselves on Thanksgiving Day, we find we go back for one, we go back for two. Maybe I've got a little bit more. Of course, I'm going to take some more uh, pie and some coffee. And then we sit down on our couch, extremely full. We turn on the TV to the cowboy game and then fall asleep until the game gets interesting. We are fat, dumb, and happy. But when we are fat, dumb, and happy, we are in danger of becoming spiritually absent from God. We make this our spiritual destination. The problem is, is that we do not digest as fast spiritually as we do physically, and the hunger pains aren't normally as obvious as when they are in the, in the physical world, and so we become spiritually the religious leaders. We become dull to the fact that we need to continue more. Right now we're fat, dumb, and happy. Why would there be anything more? However, when we see the fruitlessness of sin and repent, we become the Canaanite woman who approaches Jesus and acknowledges herself to be the lowest of the low, which, is, which we are in the state of sin. She realizes she is hungry and goes out to find food. In recognition of this, Jesus says to her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And she is restored to wholeness once again. Just like we, when we seek out Jesus, we realize that we have been, we, we have been contented. We reach out to, to Jesus and say, I am hungry, feed me. We are now restored to wholeness. With a spiritual appetite, we are hungry. When we are hungry, we eat, and then we are satisfied. And just like in real life, this food is not something, is not just something to fill our stomachs, it is something that does something for us. It causes us to grow. When we're younger, it causes us to grow up. 
When we're oldly sad, when we're older, sadly, it causes us to grow out. That's beside the point. The growth that is, is unseen to us, but it happens nonetheless. And eventually, our bodies tell us that we are hungry again. We just have to be spiritually awakened to the fact that we are indeed hungry. The same thing happens to us spiritually. When we eat and are satisfied, we grow, though we don't see it. And when we grow, we do indeed become hungry again. But just like dinner time in my house, my youngest and my oldest, they both come to dinner. But my youngest eats less than my oldest. She just doesn't have the stomach to eat as much. And so she eats less and she is satisfied. But if my oldest was to eat the same amount and call herself full, she would be deceiving herself. Because it takes more for her to, to be satisfied than it did when she was younger. If we are not carefully aware of this, and that we grow spiritually, and when, when we are fed, we can become content because we are filling ourselves similar to when we were young, when it takes less to fill us. The problem is that just like with the religious leaders, when things are, when we are full spiritually, we actually tend not toward greater reliance on God, but toward stagnation. And stagnation is harmful. So we have to remind ourselves from time to time that we are hungry. And also that our spiritual tanks take more to fill as we grow. This, it has to be admitted, is very difficult right now to achieve. Spiritual feeding is choked off due to, the, to our needing to provide safety during a pandemic. This actually is a great time to take your spiritual pulse and to look around and see if you are spiritually content or spiritually hungry. If you are spiritually content during a time when the spiritual tap is kinked off, only letting a small amount through, maybe it's time that you stretch yourself spiritually. Because to be fully fed this to be fully fed this way is to be content with less. If you notice yourself wanting more, then maybe it's time to figure out how we can make this happen. There are two types of people in our lesson today contented saints and hungry sinners. One, though thinking himself to be spiritually full in reality, is spiritually blind. And in his blindness, he reaches out to bite the hand seeking to feed him. The other understands that he is spiritually hungry, and he begs and begs the master for scraps. And when the master does reach down to provide food, he gobbles it up. Either way, we're sinful dogs, and it's important that we acknowledge that, because until we acknowledge that, we cannot grow anymore. But one spiritual dog is blind to this, to this fact, and he harms. The other is aware of it, and he seeks to do something about it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.